Good morning, Destiny family and friends. We want to thank you all for joining in with us to worship this morning. Hey, if there's something that we could do to enhance your online worship experience, would you let us know? Uh, you can email us at info at destinyweb.org. Uh, the other thing that I wanted you, and this is just a special request from your pastors. We know that there's a number of you that watch every week, but you don't check in on the chat. Would you please just check in on the chat, uh, say good morning, Destiny family, or just let us know that you're there and check in and we won't ask anything else of you. If you could do that for us, that would be great. Now I'm gonna pray and we're gonna get right into the worship set. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you, realizing, Lord, that you've made a way for us out of no way. Lord, many hearts are heavy this week with all the things that are going on in our nation. Lord, we are lamenting as a congregation. Lord, we lament under the weight of this pandemic praying that you would bring healing and relief and provision. Lord, we're lamenting under the weight of racial injustice and tension in our country. Lord, won't you bring healing and reconciliation? Lord, we are groaning under the weight of some have for their healing, Lord, and for a lack of provision. Won't you please, Lord, bring relief? bring healing, bring whatever deliverance is needed today for your people. Now bless our time of worship. Lord, in the singing, in the preaching, Lord, in the prayers, we pray, Lord, that you would bless our time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, come on. Praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow. We are so thankful and so blessed to once again be with you this week as we worship and we praise and we give honor to our Lord and Savior. I'm Janet Lynn. I'm Michelle. And I'm Carmen. And again, we welcome each and every one of you, those of you that are out there on our online interactive site. I want you to start pressing and tapping that heart icon. Tap that button and let that love rise. Let it rise. Let it rise. You know what? Uh, I know that we celebrated the, the, uh, the Memorial Day uh, weekend and holiday and what have you. And, and for so many people, I know it was so different. Uh, it was really different for me. I'm used to being with family and friends and what have you. But you know what the Lord put in my spirit this week? That sometimes we just need to appreciate and be open to change. Things change in life. You know what? And sometimes uh, you just got to look for the small things. Uh, you know, I am not an outdoor person. And those of you that know me, you know that really well. I'm the type of person that when you invite me over your house for a cookout, I'm going to stay inside in the air conditioning. But you know what? This week I had an opportunity to just go out on the deck and just sit and just li just be still. It's a song that you sang so beautifully last week, sister, uh, Peace Be Still. It's just sometimes just those quiet moments that you just appreciate what God is doing. And I don't know why I said all of that, but you know what? I think that somebody needed to hear that this morning, that although things are different, difference doesn't always, or different doesn't always mean bad. Amen? Amen. Start to appreciate the good things in life. Sister Carmen, go ahead and lead us in worship. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, yes. for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. You know, when I read that scripture this morning, I just thought about the fact that sometimes we take so many things for granted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, waking up, the sunshine that we've had the past few days, even yeah. the rainfall yeah. today. <laughs> you know, that the grass and the vegetation needs, and we just take God for granted. You know, he is so good to us. It says his mercy, his mercies are new every morning. Yes. So can we just take a moment to say thank you to God? Thank you, Jesus. Just yes, say Lord. thank you, Jesus. Yes. Give glory to God because he's worthy. And we don't want to take him for granted. We don't want to take thank his you. goodness and his mercy for granted. That's right. That's and thank right. you, Janet, for that. You're right. We, we need to just sometimes be still and know mm -hmm. that he is God. He is God. Amen. Amen. Let's Amen. worship him and praise him this morning. Glory to God. 
glory, to glory, to glory, to glory, to glory, to God. Glory to glory, to glory, to glory, to glory, to glory, to God. To the only wise Savior, the majesty, dominion, and power forever and ever and ever be glorified to the only wise Savior, the majesty, dominion, and Rejoice in all his goodness and be thankful for all he has done. Tell the generations from the mountain to the valley by his spirit the victory is won. For the Lord is worthy to be praised, his hand of salvation.
Well, good morning and welcome to Destiny Church Online. My name is Calvin Brown. I'm one of the co-pastors here at Destiny Church, and we're grateful that you have chosen to join us again, and for many of you uh, once again uh, this morning. Um, I want to take a moment to remind you of our vision. Uh, it's normally printed in the bulletins when we're here live, but I wanted to, to remind you that, you know, our vision is to be a diverse body of people, a family of people who are uh, embracing intimacy with God, meaning we're learning to talk with God and walk with God and, and have a, a close relationship with Him, that uh, we are then secondly experiencing Christ-like relationships. God will want to see us not only have love for Him, but loving our neighbor as ourselves. And that, that cuts across every relationship. And then thirdly, if we're loving people, we're serving people. We're extending um, and exercising our God-given gifts, not only in the church to uh, the brothers and sisters of Christ, but in the community where God gives us opportunity. That gives us the permission to um, extend our grace stories, telling people about the goodness of God in our lives. And then finally, engage in our circle of influence, realizing that, um, you know, if we're walking with Jesus Christ and we're on mission with him, you know, we're touching lives and impacting lives and seeking to advance the kingdom and draw people into the kingdom just like he did. And together we'll be a body of people who are giving the people in this region and our circles of influence repeated opportunities to see, hear, and respond to the gospel and then participate in the work that God has called us to. So um, thank you for those who have made that commitment to grow in those ways. And our commitment is to help you um, in any way that we can. Uh, there's so much going on in the world around us, and we are not uh, unaware of those things. Um, but this morning, we want to put um, everything that's going on in the world around us, put it in, into proper context. Um, that God is in control, that he has called us into relationship with himself, and that he is doing a work in us um, and a work through us. And Pastor Trent is going to be... Um, kicking off a new series this morning in First Peter, and uh, just looking forward to just hearing um, through Pastor Trent from the Word of God on the kind of people we ought to be in these very unprecedented times. So um, before I pray, I do want to take an opportunity to just say thank you for just your faithful giving. These have been very trying times uh, in a number of ways, but financially for us. But your faithful giving, uh, God's grace flowing through you, uh, 
uh, has been a blessing. Um, so thank you. And we encourage you to continue to faithfully give. And we've given several ways to do that through the Give Plus app. Uh, you can click on the button right there on the page that you're watching now where it says donate and that'll take you to a donation page. You can drop off your offering here or mail it um, to 9550 Ravenna Road, Twinsburg, Ohio 44087. So let's pray and continue in worship. So Father, we, uh, we thank you. We thank you that uh, you are faithful and caring and loving God. Um, nothing happens um, in all the universe without you fully being aware of it. You hold all things together by the power of your word. Um, although you're a big and powerful um, God, you're also an intimate and loving Father. And we thank you for that. And these are challenging, troubling times in so many ways. Um, we're just trusting you to, first of all, bring peace and calm to our hearts. You tell us not to be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving to present our request to you and then allow that peace of God, which transcends all understanding to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So no matter what's going on, we can have a calmness of mind and heart and spirit and focus on those things that are true and noble and right, the things that are pure and lovely and admirable, all those things that are excellent and praiseworthy, and we'll experience that peace of God. So thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the people of God. We can walk together and encourage each other and correct each other and, um, and just be there for one another. Blessings upon Pastor Trent as he brings the message today to all those who work behind the scenes, um, those, those, who us, those leading us in worship, um, and all those who are gathered here uh, virtually, Lord, to fellowship and to, to worship, to celebrate, to learn and to grow. And again, thank you for your faithfulness flowing through so many um, in giving, Lord, and um, that this work could continue to, to thrive. We love you and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, thank you, praise team. Thank you for that reminder of lyrically our identity in Christ. We are who he says we are. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, Lord, that you have given us, Lord, complete acceptance and love, Lord, and your endorsement as your sons and daughters, that we are who you say we are. Thank you that you love us in spite of us. We pray now, Lord, that you incline our ears to hear, Lord, and that you incline our hearts to receive. We pray, Father, that you would, Lord, empower your word as it goes forth. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Allow us to do in that realm what we cannot do on our own. And so, Lord, we pray for your church that you would empower her, encourage her, Lord, and lift up bowed down heads and strengthen weak knees. We pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's been many years since I've been away, since I went away to, to college for the first time. And uh, I can remember some of the things that were going on in my heart and mind and some of the things that I was processing as I was getting ready to go. You know, I realized that I would be a 10 hour car drive away from home and that airfare at that time, uh, it just wasn't affordable for us. And so failure was not an option. And my father had told me many years earlier to always remember who I was and who I represent. I knew that our family name came with some standards and I was expected to keep them. And so that was an internal core value that I had when I was going away to school. When I look back on that time, I made a lot of dumb decisions and I made a lot of mistakes, but I still had some internal non-negotiables that I clung to and three of them were that number one, that I would not bring home any failing grades. Number two, that I would not quit. And number three, that I would not waste my father's money. You see, I made all those decisions in advance before I had taken one class, simply based on my family identity. I had a standard to live up to. Live up to. Well, it's the same way in the body of Christ. As, as the church, we're part of a family. And everything we do stems from that family identity. The way we view this world, the decisions that we make, the lines that we draw on the sand, all of those things stem from our family identity. You know, it's been two and a half months since we've been the church gathered and that we've been able to be together in person. And I have to tell you that I really miss seeing my church family in person. I really miss being able to hug you and laugh and joke with you and to worship and pray and preach with you in person because we're not able to do any of those things right now. But listen, even though we're not, we're still the church. In the span of the two and a half months that we've been the church scattered, we've watched the number of pandemic fatalities go up to six figures. We've seen continuing incidents of racial injustice and we also have looming over our head an election season, which I can guarantee you is going to end in some gloating and some grieving the outcome, sadly, in the body of Christ. And so with all of that noise spinning in the background, we have to ask the question of the church. What really matters when the church is scattered? during these times that we're living in? What are those grounding principles that are going to anchor us when everyone else is being tossed to and fro by the waves of disruption? We're starting a new series this morning and for the next several weeks, we're gonna be going through the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter was written during a time when the church had been scattered because of persecution. The Emperor Nero was torturing and killing Christians and the Apostle Peter had written the book 
to encourage the church to stay the course with Jesus no matter what. And that's our motivation to preach it to you. We want to encourage you to stay the course with Jesus no matter what. Turn with me in your Bibles and devices to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, I don't want you to get excited because it's only two verses, because I could literally spend an hour on each of those two verses. I'm not going to do that. I could do that, but I know you probably wouldn't stick around for it. Um, we're going to get through it as quickly and as adeptly as we can. First Peter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. As one of the original 12 disciples that walked with Jesus, Peter had great authority. His voice had weight in the church. In the early days of his ministry, Peter was known to be spontaneous and impulsive. He was that dude. <laughs> Peter was always the first one to speak or to act. You know, Peter, along with his brother Andrew, left their fishing business immediately when Jesus came calling. Peter is the one that boldly declared that Jesus was the Son of God and the long-awaited Messiah. Peter was the one who accepted Jesus' invitation to walk on water. And Peter was the one that was ready to fight when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. And yes, Peter was that same one who denied Jesus three times in the heat of the moment. But we also know that he was restored very powerfully one morning on the, on the side of a beach. So he was no doubt impulsive and spontaneous. But after the resurrection, Peter was on fire. Peter was a leader of the apostles and a pillar of the church. He was bold and filled with the Holy Spirit and he preached with power and he was fearless in his preaching in, even in the face of death or great bodily harm. And so his message to the church at a time when they were scattered was first to remind them of their identity, of who they were and who they represented. And that's where we're going to start this series whether gathered or scattered, Destiny Church, you are God's people. Whether gathered or scattered, you are God's people. Verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect. Stop right there. Who are God's elect? That word elect means to choose and so there's a couple of definitions that have been around for centuries in the body of Christ for what that word means. And one of those definitions of the elect is all those whom God has decided in advance by his grace would become his children. Let me repeat that again. All those whom God has decided in advance by his grace would become his children. Definition number two, the elect are all those whom God knew in advance would respond to his grace and become his children. I'll read it again. All those whom God knew in advance would respond to his grace and become his children. Whichever those two camps you're in, even if you're not in either of them, you, you won't choose uh, because you know enough to know that there's biblical evidence to back up either one of them. But either one that you choose, the bottom line is that God's elect are his people for all eternity. God's elect are his people for all eternity. You know, I come from a very large extended family 
on both sides of my family. And I have great memories of my family getting together, uh, enjoying one another, laughing and joking and getting to know one another. But I realize that that isn't everybody's experience. In the movie Antoine Fisher, it's about a young man who grew up in the foster care system. And it talks about the horrors that he experienced as a ward of the state. But one of the things that Antoine Fisher would do just to get himself through some of the terrible times that he experienced, he would regularly have a vision of what it would be like to meet his real family. And in those visions, those recurring visions that he would have, he would see a, a room that <laughs> had a dining room table that had an elaborate spread of food, of all the finest foods that you could ask for. And in that room were the smiling and welcoming faces of the family members that he had never met. And they were there welcoming him and accepting him and loving him. And he got himself through the bad times with those recurring visions. Well, the church is a forever family. And the Bible says that one day our entire family is going to get together in what's called the wedding supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19 talks about it. But people from every nation and tongue are all going to be gathered around God's table, celebrating what Jesus Christ has done for us. And we look forward to that day. John 1, 12 and 13 says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but children born of God. <clears throat> you know, my first experience with the family of God as an adult was not a great one. I'm ashamed to say. Uh, when I started dating my wife, I started going to her church and I hadn't yet committed my life to Christ. And I took one look around at the people that were there and, and I just couldn't picture myself having anything in common with anybody and I didn't feel like I fed in, fit in. But over time, because of the love that I received, the hospitality that I received, the great wisdom that I received, the great patience that they exercised on my behalf. And because of the great preaching and teaching that I experienced, those people literally became my family. To this day, whenever I go back there, my wife and I, it's a home going. They're our family and they're going to be our forever family from now on. And one of the things they told me when I came here was that if they ever mistreat you, you are not an orphan. You have a church home. You have a family that is waiting to receive you with open arms. And they meant it. And thankfully, though, I've been treated well here. But every time I go back, it's a homecoming. I want to ask you this morning, what is your view of the body of Christ? Have you embraced your forever family? You know, uh, the next line that he uses to describe the church is exiles scattered throughout the provinces. Exiles scattered throughout the provinces. Some of your translations might say, pilgrims of the dispersion or exiles of the dispersion. But when persecution took place in Jerusalem, the church actually grew because when God's people left, wherever they went, they were still God's people. And so when they were scattered throughout, first of all, the region, uh, they were God's people in that region. And the people that didn't know about Jesus they shared their story. And when Paul or Peter came through preaching the gospel, the people had already seen a great witness from the members of the church that were already there. 
And so when he uses that word exiles and scattered, it means that these people were deported from their homeland or for pilgrims of the dispersion. These people were travelers. They literally had picked up and left Jerusalem and they were living in a region that was not their permanent home. My brothers and my sisters, we are exiles in this world today. This is not our home. We're just passing through here. This is a temporary residence. And I'm not a camping fan, nor have I ever been, but I've never seen anyone try to hook up cable television in a tent. I've never seen anyone try to put down wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in a tent simply because we know we're not gonna be staying long. Pretty soon, we're gonna be gathering up our things and going home. But our citizenship is in heaven. It isn't here. And that's why we could also be considered exiles who are scattered here. And so wherever you are, you are God's people. And you're also chosen and set apart for him. You're chosen and set apart for him. In the first two parts of verse two, it says, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. The first thing that I wanna point out is that you see all three persons of the Trinity involved in our salvation. Do you see that in the text? Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ. What is Peter saying? Well, Peter is telling the church that God the Father planned for us to be his. Number two, the Holy Spirit made that plan a reality. Remember, being born again is a work of the Spirit. And number three, obedience to Jesus is what confirmed that reality, is what proved it to be legit. Let's start with that word chosen because it's loaded. Chosen. Chosen is important because in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, the Hebrews, the Jews, they were the undisputed chosen people of God. Fast forward to the New Testament. And because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, God's people are now Jews and Gentiles. In fact, the church is comprised of mostly Gentiles to this day. But it's still the same way it was when, God's, when God chose the nation of Israel. It was totally by his grace. It wasn't because they were so great. It wasn't because they were so grand. It was actually just the opposite. He took a people who were not a people and he led them to prominence on the world stage. He literally took the nation of Israel from the guttermost to the uttermost. And he did the same thing with us. You see, none of us, none of us were deserving of this salvation that we received. It was purely by grace. And that's what he's saying in the text. God's people in the New Testament are now both Jew and Gentile, still only by his grace. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by his grace. Next thing he says is, Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Remember, God the Father planned it. The Holy Spirit carried it out, made it a reality. We were born again spiritually. 
The Greek word for sanctifying comes from that root word of sanctify, and it means to set apart and to dedicate to the service of and loyalty to. And so if you read it in that way, we were set apart to be dedicated to, lo to the Lord our God and loyal to him and him only. Your life is not your own. My life is not my own we've been set apart to him and for him. So church, wherever you are, you're God's people. You're chosen and set apart for him. And number three, you're obedient to Jesus Christ. You're obedient to Jesus Christ. In the last part of verse two, it says, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. And it tells us the purpose of it all. The purpose of the purpose of us being the elect and chosen and set apart isn't so we can just bide our time and then go to heaven. That's not it. The end game for all of it is obedience to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 10, it says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Listen, which God prepared in advance for us to do, God prepared in advance for us to do. So not only did he choose us in advance, he chose us in advance for a purpose. The sanctifying work of the spirit was to set us apart for something in particular. He had good works in mind for us. Next line is to be sprinkled with his blood to be sprinkled with his blood. That's a reference to the Old Testament sacrificial system. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so the blood represented the sealing of the covenant. And because blood represents life, sprinkling it, sprinkling it on the people represented God's commitment to them in the Old Testament. Fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus in the upper room at the Last Supper, he tells the disciples that the wine that they're serving, it represents his blood, which is poured out for many. His blood was the sealing of the new covenant. And that's what he's talking about here. No more bulls and goats and rams and lambs. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world once and for all. The new covenant is sealed by his blood. It's a done deal. His blood satisfied the wrath of God. And if you receive what he's done for you, you are covered by that blood. You know, part of the evidence that you're legit is that you're obedient to Jesus and you're sprinkled with his blood. One of my favorite parts of the movie, The Ten Commandments, is when God had Moses to instruct the Israelites to paint the doorpost of their houses with the blood of an unblemished lamb. And so when the death angel descended on Egypt, he passed over each and every one of those homes that was covered by the blood of the lamb. Fast forward to the New Testament. When you say yes to Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, you become covered by the blood of the Lamb once and for all. Done deal. Amen and amen. You can click on the heart button if you, if you like what you're hearing. So church, wherever you are, wherever you are, whether gathered or scattered, you are the God's people. You're chosen and set apart for him. You're obedient to Jesus Christ and you are overflowing with grace and peace. You are overflowing with grace and peace. Peter ends his greeting with the pastoral blessing on the people. He tells them grace and peace be yours in abundance. Some of your, trans tr some of your translations might say grace and peace be multiplied to you. Well, why doesn't he just say grace and peace be yours and make it a done deal? 
Don't you hate when preachers ask you a question that they know the answer to already? And I'm doing it the whole time. Well, well, Peter doesn't just say grace and peace be yours. He adds in abundance or multiplied to you for a reason. He says, may you have more than enough grace and peace. More than enough. I believe it's because he knows that this journey that we're on is going to require a continuous supply. And he wouldn't have prayed that for us if we couldn't have it. The journey that we on, there's going to be some trials and there's going to be some tribulation. Pandemics are going to come out of nowhere and people are going to be asking the question, what is going on? What is God doing here? And all of us are going to need a daily portion of grace and peace. The times that we're living in, we might even need a double portion. It's what I call the manna concept. You see, in the Old Testament, God fed the nation of Israel manna, the equivalent of frosted flakes. And the catch to it was he only gave them enough for the day. They couldn't store it. They couldn't hoard it. They had to depend on him. And listen to this. Every day they had to go out and gather it. And so you and I have a storehouse of grace and peace that is available to us. But we got to ask for it. He's not just going to give it to us. We got to ask him for his grace and his peace on a daily basis. You know, the song that comes to mind is, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. That's the song that's on our lips. And so, church, when I say that we are the church scattered at this point in time, that we are God's people, that we are chosen and set apart for him, that we are obedient to Christ and that we're overflowing with grace and peace. That's, that's a whole lot of good theology. It's a goal. It's a whole lot of stuff to stick your chest out about. It's a whole lot to be thankful for. But he didn't give it to us for that. He gave it to us for a purpose. That identity is a reminder that you were saved to serve. We were saved to serve. Your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. You know, every week we put on the bottom of your sermon notes what we call the five E's. And there'll be at least one of them that will relate to the message that day. The E for today is engaging your circle of influence. But I'm going to come back to that. During this time that we're not able to worship and fellowship and pray together in person, during times like these, there's the tendency of some to fall away or to lose hope or to become apathetic and just sort of meander your way through it all and wait for some ending that may or may not come to pass. But that's not an option for us. You see, part of what comes with our identity is engagement. And so the five E's, the, the E for today is engaging our circle of influence. You know, the way that I remember our five E's, and by the way, what the five E's are, are what we consider the five marks of a follower of Jesus Christ. The five marks of a disciple of Jesus Christ. I call it 5G. 5G, I remember it because God, groups, gifts, grace story, and geography. What am I talking about? Number one, a follower of Jesus Christ is committed to a lifelong relationship with him, deepening, ever deepening relationship with him, embracing intimacy with God. Number two, a follower of Jesus Christ is going to experience Christ-like relationships in a group, whether it's you and one other person or two or three or five or ten. The fact of the matter is that you're all on journey together, that you're not going through this journey alone, 
that you're committed to one another's growth and enhancement of your faith. So God groups, number three, gifts. Exercising your God-given gifts in the church and in the community. God has given every believer at least one spiritual gift for, the, for you to use for the betterment of the body, for the betterment of this world, in addition to your talents and your abilities. And so he wants you to exercise the use of that gift, those abilities and those talents. So God groups gifts, grace story. All of us who are in the body of Christ are in there only because of God's grace. We all have a story on what God did to bring us into his family. And he calls on us to share that story with whoever we come in contact with. And so sharing our grace story is a part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And the final G, God, groups, gifts, grace story, and geography. We talk about engaging our circle of influence. Your circle of influence is the place where God has put you in your neighborhood, in your family and extended family, in the job where you work, the school that you attend, whatever that is, that's your domain. That's the area where people know you and you know people. And so what I'm saying to you this morning, I'm challenging you, church, is that during this time of pandemic, while the world is on fire, that you're not lulled to sleep just because we cannot be the church gathered. Even when we're the church scattered, you're still the church and God is looking for you and I to engage our circle of influence. The world is waiting for us to engage one person at a time. Think how much difference you can make with the racial tension going on right now one person at a time. Think of what difference that you can make in somebody's life who is suffering in this pandemic right now. The opportunities abound. And so I wanna challenge you because our identity matters. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I'm challenged by your word myself when I point the finger at your people, four more are pointing back at me and Lord, I feel the weight of it, the responsibility of it. So I ask you along with the rest of your people, help us, empower us, open our eyes, open our eyes and our ears to look around us and see where we can make an impact. I pray Lord that you fill us with your spirit that this won't just be information, that we will take these great and precious truths and Lord, let them be the fuel and the wind in our sails. We pray that you are glorified by each family represented under the sound of my voice. Our prayer is not only for Destiny Church, but for every church that names the name of Jesus Christ would be activated during this time that we would be your hands and feet. And I keep saying this over and over again, Lord, but I pray that we would be able to show a watching and waiting world, not only how we love one another, but how we love them and prove in so doing that we are your disciples. Help us, O Lord, and be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.
continue to smile on you and just remember that line that through the storm remember that he is Lord of all until next week may you continue to be blessed